I'm going to say hello to all these happy faces. Hello, Mark. Good evening. Everybody always looks so happy on Zoom. Good Three evening, days. everyone. Hello. Mayor Moran, and Chair Murphy, I do show at 5 p.m. if you'd like to call the meeting to order. Yes. Um, do we have all of our commissioners on as well? I believe we are only missing uh, Commissioner Rodriguez, and I do know that he will be absent this evening. Thank you. Well, welcome all. It's nice to see everybody. We don't usually have these joint meetings, but it's kind of nice. Um, welcome to the joint meeting of the Katati City Council and the successor agency to the former Katati Community Redevelopment Agency and the Planning Commission, Tuesday, October 12th, 2021. Ms. Burgess, if you would kindly do a roll call for us. Commissioner Hancock. Yes. Commissioner Moore. I believe she's trying to log in in the other room. Okay, I will come back to Commissioner Moore. Thank you. I will show Commissioner Rodriguez as absent. Vice Chair Lemus. Here. Chair Murphy. Here. Council Member Harvey. Here. Council Member Sparks. Here. Council Member Ford. Here. Vice Mayor Landman. Here. Mayor Moore. Here. Thank you very much. Um, so right now, this is really just a presentation. So I will open it up for public comment. If we have any public comment on this particular issue. Thank you, Mayor Moore. I'm looking to our attendees tonight. If you have a public comment, please use your raised hand icon. If you're dialing in, you can also dial star nine. Mayor Moore, that will end public comment. Thank you so much. And now I believe this will be turned over to our community development director, Mr. House. Thank you, Mayor Moore, members of the council and the commission uh, and the public. Really appreciate everyone being here this evening for this special meeting a little earlier than usual. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Noah Hausch. I'm the community development director. Uh, and uh, this will be the first meeting. Uh, tonight's the first meeting in a year long process to update the city's housing element, um, which talks about the goals, policies, and programs for the next eight years with regards to housing. Uh, the city was very fortunate to secure some excellent consulting services to assist with this venture, and the council approved these contracts at their last meeting on September 28th. Uh, Four Leaf will be leading the housing element update. Civic Edge will be leading the public engagement process, and Rincon will be doing the CEQA analysis necessary for the city to adopt uh, and get the housing element certified. Um, it's worth noting that while we have these excellent consulting firms, uh, their staff that's joining them as, uh, and joining us that to do the work is local. Uh, and we are joined this evening by housing gurus, Jane Riley. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard her name. She's been around Sonoma County housing circles for uh, a long time. And Luke Lindenbush, uh, who will be doing the presentation this evening. I'll also be available for some questions and may chime in here or there, but it's pretty much going to be Luke leading the discussion. Uh, and we have a lot of material to cover over the next hour, and I want to leave time for your questions. So with that, I will turn it over to Luke. And I believe he has a PowerPoint that Lauren will be bringing up. And thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Noah, uh, for that introduction. And good evening, uh, council members and commissioners. It's great to be able to present to you uh, today. Um, as Noah mentioned, I am part of the team with Four Leaf, uh, present, or, which will be preparing the housing element um, for the city of uh, Katati. Um, and uh, I'm joined tonight by our, our Director of Housing Policy, Jane Riley, and I uh, work with Four Leaf as a housing policy planner. Um, so, uh, just want to clarify, um, just getting, we'll get, all, get the share screen going here. 
um, and get this presentation started. Um, just want to clarify um, that in addition to uh, delivering the city's uh, housing element um, for the city, we are also uh, coordinating a planning collaborative, the Napa Sonoma Housing Collaborative, um, with uh, the that covers the 16 jurisdictions in Napa and Sonoma counties. So the presentation that we'll be providing this evening um, is actually uh, part of the collaborative work, and I'll be going a little bit more into the details of that work. But uh, in short, technical assistance provided uh, to all of the jurisdictions um, in Napa and Sonoma counties. We're really uh, excited to be providing some of this technical assistance, especially to smaller jurisdictions like Katani. Um, so just going over a little agenda of uh, the presentation tonight. Um, I know you've had some great information from Myers Nave and other uh, panelists who have come forward to talk to you about housing law. So I'm not going to try to get too into the weeds about the details of the housing law, but just in general, want to give an overview of the housing element itself. Um, talk a bit about site inventories um, and other new laws as they affect the housing element process. Talk about some demographics specific to the city of Katadi and how they shape the housing need. Uh, and go over in general what the project timeline and next steps are going to be looking like over the next few years um, and have some time for the end for questions from council and commission discussion and um, some community input as well. Luke, can I stop you for just a second? Councilmember Harvey, did you have a, your hand raised or a question? Well, it looks like Commissioner Moore was trying to get in. She was on the attendees, but now she's dropped off again. I didn't know whether there was a problem getting her promoted, but now she's dropped off again. She's back in. I'm here. Okay, perfect. Right. Thanks. I was Thank trying you. to get you back in. <laughs> Luke, thank you. Go ahead. Excellent. No problem. Glad we're all here. Um, so just to go over what, what the housing element is. Um, so it's a chapter of the general plan, and the housing element, in short, must include an inventory of developable sites, a review of constraints, both governmental and non-governmental, uh, how well you did on your last housing element. And also there are some new statutory requirements, uh, including affirmatively furthering fair housing, um, which looks at proactively preventing segregation patterns uh, and making sure that uh, there, there aren't uh, low income housing clustered in one particular portion of the city, things of, things of that sort. So just going over the, the broad overview of housing elements, I um, just want to draw your attention to this first bullet point here, which is that state law mandates local governments to adequately plan to meet existing and projected housing needs of all economic segments of the community. And I think this is particularly important to bring up because oftentimes when we think about RENA, the regional housing needs allocation, we think about the number that is handed down from the state for the number of houses that we have to build. Um, and yes, that number is important and that's part of it, um, but there's also the nuances that are layered in of which income levels need to be planned for, um, for all types of housing, uh, not just single family homes. And again, also looking at aspects like affirmatively furthering fair housing. So the housing element overall is a comprehensive and pretty complicated process uh, that layers all these things in. Um, but I just want to give a general overview of um, you know, how we can be helpful in delivering the housing element for, for the city of Katadi and also where we can get some, some input here. Um, so uh, the, the housing element is also unique among other uh, elements of the general plan and that it is required to undergo review from the Department of Housing and Community Development. And that review is intensifying over years. Um, there's recent laws that have just been passed in recent weeks that uh, enhance the regulatory authority of the state uh, to make sure that in, uh, jurisdictions are compliant with the housing element and also doing everything they need to. Um, so for this housing element, we'll be going over the cycle from 2023 to 2031. But being certified is ultimately what is most important. Um, and there are a lot of benefits to HCD certification and also a lot of consequences for jurisdictions um, if uh, they don't meet, have a compliant housing element. Uh, so for one, um, jurisdictions uh, without uh, a compliant housing element can lose their ability to regulate land use decisions on a local level. Um, so if there are inadequate sites or if uh, the, the Department of Housing and Community Development deems it insufficient, um, then the discretionary review over how the city is zoned and how it meets the housing need uh, then will go to the courts. Um, it's also really important just to have a certified housing element because it doesn't just affect housing funding, um, although that is very important, but it affects a wide range of state funding that the city of Katadi is el eligible to receive, including parks, transit, bike lanes, pedestrian improvements, climate action improvements, uh, and the list just continues to grow over time. Uh, 
So now we're going to talk a little bit about the regional housing need allocation, which I know you've had some presentations on before, um, and you're probably well um, versed in at this point. But RENA is ultimately uh, the number that you get from the state, and it's also housing that you have to plan and zone for by come. Um, so cities zone for, for land, uh, have to zone for land at high enough densities that developers can work with uh, the, the plan that is put forward. So uh, cities must zone for their fair share of the region's overall identified housing need, um, and uh, the affordability assumptions are linked to density and zoning. So where does this number come from? Um, again, there's a really big number that comes from the state, and then it is uh, funneled into the different jurisdictional authorities uh, where the regional uh, housing need determination results in the ho regional housing need allocation. So for the entirety of the Bay Area, um, this has been a huge increase over the last cycle from 187,000 to 441,000. Uh, and the Bay Area is also not distinct statewide in this large increase. Um, in fact, Southern California has actually increased to a greater degree than the Bay Area. But um, Nevertheless, the regional housing needs allocation uh, is proportional based on population and other factors. Um, so this increase of almost 135% um, is reflective of the housing crisis, uh, the scale of uh, the need to have uh, adequate and bold action on housing. Um, and once again, is consistent with increases around the state. So just to give a glance of how this is uh, shaken out in Sonoma County, uh, you can see that uh, Katadi's uh, allocation is pretty comparable to other small jurisdictions like Cloverdale and Sebastopol. Uh, and in general, for Sonoma County, uh, the unincorporated allocation is was higher than anticipated and, and relatively high. So I just want to note the asterisk on the left that appeals could change these figures slightly. Uh, the city of Katadi uh, did not submit an appeal on its regional housing needs allocation. So. Uh, it's not going to go down, but if any of the other appeals submitted around the county, um, in particular the unincorporated one, if they're accepted, um, that could change those figures, um, and it will be allocated proportionally. So you're not going to see an increase uh, to the magnitude of hundreds for the city of Katadi, uh, but you might see a little bit. So from the RENA process, RHN, ARHND, then uh, came the HMC, HCD, just to add to the acronyms here. Uh, but in short, the Housing Methodology Committee um, of ABAG, which uh, our Director of Housing Policy, Jane Riley, sat on, uh, designed and recommended a methodology. Uh, and the one that we're working with in this process uh, was modeled after Planned Area 2050. Uh, so in, this is uh, the time where we're going through the appeals and HCD is looking at the methodology, uh, or, there, or the methodology has been approved, but uh, looking at the appeals, looking at the final RENA allocation, which we can expect to see by the end of the year. Um, so once again, we can expect to see some RENA coming from the county um, leading up to the housing element due date in 2023. So just another way to look at uh, the process and where we're at, we're in this middle segment here, um, cities and counties updating the housing elements based on RENA. Um, and after this, we will uh, be getting a certified housing element uh, and keeping Katadi within the realm of local control and in the end of a successful housing element process. So once again, I uh, want to go a little bit into the new state housing laws. Uh, first, want to have a really big disclaimer on this that I am not an attorney. Uh, and of course, the most important and best person to ask about how this will affect the city of Katadi in general is the city attorney of Katadi. Uh, but just want to give a little bit of an overview of what we're looking at in, some, in terms of some of these sites. So some of them directly deal with the housing element itself uh, and the process, uh, deadlines, things like that. And there are actually some here that have been uh, taking place over the, over the last couple of weeks, including uh, bringing the deadline from, from rezoning to, from three years to one year, things like that. So some of them are more uh, technical and procedural in nature. However, there are a handful of bills that have also uh, just reshaped the regulatory landscape uh, in terms of housing in California, and all of that will be factored in, whether it's uh, looking at recent bills that have uh, altered single family zoning to allow for lot splits and uh, building of duplexes by right of SB9 uh, or other bills um, that, had, that had occurred in the past um, to that end, whether SB50, SB330. SB um, so all of this uh, has builds builds a picture of what we're working with the, with the housing element and uh, we're working uh, with NOAA and, and staff and, and with city attorney and with uh, our, our, our legal consultation as well to get an understanding of how this a uh, wide breadth of laws will, will impact the document that's developed over the next year or so. 
So one of these laws is AD 801397, um, and uh, this is the site's inventory, um, which is the inventory of land that is suitable and available for development. Um, so AB 1397 uh, tightened up the process a little bit for how the housing element looks at which sites are available. Um, and it made sure that the sites that are non-vacant or unlikely to develop um, aren't selected in uh, referring housing element updates. Uh, it strengthened uh, the, the government code uh, 65880, the predominant housing element law, um, which requires rezoning as well for a variety of housing types, not just for single family zoning, but also for things such as duplexes, triplexes, missing middle housing, uh, homeless housing, uh, single residence occupancies, uh, and also ties in with affirmatively furthering fair housing laws to this end. Uh, so one downside of this is, or, or one, one aspect of this to consider is that the definition of vacant land is pretty strict. So if you have a parking lot, for example, that's not considered vacant land, just raw, um, you know, just completely undeveloped land, even if it's a, you know, dilapidated site that wouldn't be considered vacant. That still can be considered in the housing element, uh, but there just needs to be justifiable reason that it should be used as a site that can't be qualified as vacant. Um, additionally, on, on AB 30, 1397, uh, once again, just requiring that strong justification if, if non-vacant sites are included in the inventory. Uh, and this was largely brought about because um, the, and the reuse of sites was regulated, was brought about um, in large part because it, they figured if, you're, if you've had a, a site uh, on your housing element, the last cycle and the cycle before that, and it hasn't been built over 16 years, the likelihood um, of, of that site being developed in the future has to be justified. Um, so we'll be getting into a little bit later in the presentation, some of the ways that we can be justifying that, um, go through the work of the collaborative and the work we're doing on the housing element for Katati. So just going in again, uh, a bit to affirmatively furthering fair housing. Um, so fair housing, this, this just requires the, the state of California and jurisdictions completing the housing element to use a fair housing lens uh, and make sure that housing sites are dispersed throughout the community. So once again, you're just not clustering all of your low income housing uh, or high income housing in one particular area. Um, it ensures that you zone for low and very low and moderate income housing in high opportunity areas. Uh, and making sure that sites in low-income areas are accompanied by social programs uh, to create strong communities. And just a table going over uh, the housing sites inventory, uh, once again, uh, really just, just illustrating uh, some of what I just went over in terms of how AB 1397, AB 686, uh, the sites inventory and affirmatively furthering for housing can intersect. So here's what happens uh, with the sites and RENA. So as RENA gets astronomically bigger, sites ultimately get smaller. And this is really the, the crux of the biggest challenge in the housing element. So here is the, a, a, an overview of some of the sites that were used on the last housing element for city of Katati. Uh, so I'm sure you can recognize that some of these uh, will not be able to be used for pretty you know, clear reasons such as the, the most the most obvious reason that uh, a housing site cannot be uh, reused in a housing element is simply that it's been built. Uh, whether it's been built for housing and it's no longer an eligible site for redevelopment or whether it's been developed for a different use, um, either of those would uh, disqualify a site from being reused. Um, there again, and other requirements uh, that uh, may have allowed a site to be eligible in the last plan uh, might not apply for this one. So. Uh, just an overview of the sites that the city of Katati is looking at. Um, some of these will be reused and some of them will not. So I want to go a little bit into the no net loss law. Uh, so agencies um, have to replace uh, the site, uh, any site in the inventory with low income housing if it, if it develops into anything else. Um, this uh, uh, essentially, the no net loss law, the goal of it is to make sure that um, housing sites are, are not uh, diminishing. So uh, essentially, um, if, so with the, with the no net, look, sorry, just lost my train of thought of it here. <laughs> um, so with the no net loss law, um, it's always good to overshoot a bit because basically this law um, says that if, uh, um, this, the, the, if, sorry, <laughs> if, uh, if a, um, it, basically if a, if a site is re rezoned um, from your list uh, and it is off of your list, um, then you have a shortened timeline uh, to be able to 
replace that in your list. So it's important um, if uh, you know a site, for example, um, becomes unavailable within the next eight years, that you have a replacement for that. Uh, so the recommendation here uh, is to not just go for 100% of what the arena is. Uh, the recommendation is usually to go to about 130%, just to allow for some flexibility and accommodation uh, in the event that sites are unavailable. Um, so this allows local control to be retained, makes sure that if you dip below that 100% um, of, uh, the, of, of the, the arena requirement for your housing element, uh, that you're going to be able to have a backup plan to deliver those sites. So I also want to go into a bit uh, the AB 72 and AB 215, um, the expanded enforcement authority, uh, and really uh, what this means for the housing element law. So uh, HCD has more authority in this cycle than they ever had um, to be able to make sure that housing elements are compliant. Uh, and also, uh, there is a little bit more teeth in this law um, for uh, the jurisdictional authority of the Attorney General uh, to be referred cases from uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development uh, for any violations uh, on this list. Originally, it, it included um, things such as the Housing Accountability Act, the No Net Loss Law, the Density Bonus Law, and anti discrimination laws. Uh, but this also now requires cities to rezone for housing sites within one year if they uh, need to add sites, uh, rezone them, uh, and additional uh, uh, expanded enforcement authority for jurisdictions not complying, complying with SB 35, the streamlined zoning, or affirmatively furthering fair housing in the site's inventory. So this is super important, public participation. Of course, uh, there's a statutory requirement um, that the local government has to make uh, a thorough effort to uh, have, have uh, as many uh, segments of the population involved in the housing element process. Um, and, and beyond that, it's also just a good thing to do to make sure that you have the best uh, housing element possible that is most representative of the community of Katadi. So just want to go again, go back into affirmatively furthering for housing. Since this is a complex topic, um, started off as a federal program reinforced by a state program. And just wanted to make sure that, that we have an understanding that it's not just how many new units a community needs, but also where they are built and who will have, have access to them. Um, so this is really a comprehensive lens to be able to look at the housing open process uh, and making sure that the city of Katadi is uh, delivering on its obligation to serve every member of its community. So in terms of the requirements, uh, the housing element also requires uh, an analysis of affirmatively furthering fair housing to identify patterns of segregation, uh, racial or ethnic concentration that may exist uh, and identify policies and programs to either reverse these or prevent them from, from happening in the future. So just going a little bit over ministerial approval, um, there have been a handful of laws, including SB 35, as I mentioned, that allows for ministerial review of housing projects um, if it includes an affordable component. So that's for multifamily residential. Um, there's also uh, new laws, uh, as I mentioned, SB 9, that allow for lot splits and duplexes on those lots and single family zones. And uh, all of this, uh, again, is streamlined, it's by right, it's done on a mere ministerial level. So there's not a public review process that the Planning Commission or the City Council. So it is important uh, that jurisdictions um, adopt objective design and development standards um, by the first of the year, which I understand Katadi is well on track to doing, if not, if has not already been done. So pivoting from some of the laws, and again, I know that's a lot, um, but Jane is online to be able to answer questions after the presentation uh, and uh, about, about any of the laws or, or the housing element process in general, but I just want to go into some demographics that uh, illustrate the city of Katadi. So as we see population trends uh, throughout Sonoma County and the Bay Area as a whole, uh, Katadi has either been in, has been roughly in line without population trends uh, and in general, outpaced the Bay Area. And in population age trends, we can see that uh, consistent with jurisdictions across the county and across the region, we have an aging population, which has uh, distinct uh, challenges and distinct needs that may be considered in the housing element process, how to take care of an aging population. And the city of Katadi is also unique in the county of Sonoma, in which many jurisdictions have a reducing population of children. Um, but over the last 10 years, Katadi has had an increasing population of children, showing that Katadi is a good place for families as well. In terms of housing tenure, uh, 
so you can see that there's there's a handful of varieties in owner occupied represented in the blue and renter occupied uh, represented in the green here uh, showing that in general uh, larger households are more likely to be renter occupied and housing tenure by age showing uh, that it's harder to own a home if you're younger um, and again no surprises here um, but uh, an increasing likelihood of home ownership uh, for people in between the ages of 45 and 75. And looking at household income level uh, by tenure as well, um, the clear takeaway here, again, if you make more than 100% of area median income, it's going to be a lot easier for you to buy a house as represented by the income levels here and home ownership in the blue bars. And households by tenure, we also see that Katadi uh, has slightly more owner occupied units uh, than the Bay Area as a whole, but slightly less than Sonoma County. In terms of household size, Katati is also pretty consistent uh, with the rest of Sonoma County and the Bay Area in terms of number of people and homes. And in terms of cost burden by race, uh, there's a handful of statistics here. Um, that uh, just illustrate uh, the, the wide gradient of cost burden um, and even showing that uh, a large amount of people who are making uh, moderate and above moderate income still are burdened by the cost of housing. Uh, and just to clarify where that threshold is, above 30% is considered a uh, cost burden in terms of housing. So disability is a huge factor in terms of considering housing needs. This is specifically looking at disability um, seniors uh, those with an ambulatory dis difficulty, independent living difficulty, hearing difficulty, cognitive difficulty, self-care difficulty, and vision difficulty. Uh, all of these have really different challenges uh, and different needs that arise when we're looking at how to address these populations. So going into a bit of the housing element needs, um, just a general overview of the project itself. The goal here is to meet local housing needs. So we want to develop a plan that is best for Katadi itself. Um, so the goal here is to cater programs and policies to the community needs. And that's really where the Planning Commission, uh, the City Council, and members of the public come in to bring the creativity and the vision for what this document can look like, not just to meet all the statutory objectives as mandated by the state, but to create a plan that is really best for the city of Katadi as a whole. And really, um, a lot of what our work is, is the more is the more technical side of things, ensuring adequate sites, looking at the inventory of sites to make sure that you don't have arena mismatch, um, and looking into creative policies that can allow a greater, broader range of site options, uh, and look, once again, uh, through all the site locations and the plan itself through an AMH lens, so you can achieve state certification. So the next steps from here. Uh, we're going to have outreach and community input ongoing through many uh, steps of the process, data collection uh, as we go. Um, th then after this, you, we'll see the draft housing strategy and preliminary sites inventory go into the fair housing al analysis and the affirmatively furthering fair housing program of actions. And then we'll have a draft housing element in HCD review. So just looking at this in a timeline form, uh, we're here at the kickoff workshop and every plum color dot is an opportunity for community input. So pretty much every step of the process, we have opportunity for community input to make sure that every voice is being heard in this process. And as Noah mentioned, uh, this housing element for the city of Katadi is uh, being delivered and, and prepared um, by three separate consultants, the Civic Edge, as if relief on the housing element prepara preparation and the CEQA documentation will be done by Rincon consultants. So just some of the ways that uh, Four Leaf and Civic Edge will be coordinating. Uh, we'll be looking overall at the feedback from the community to make sure that it informs our housing strategy, the policies and programs therein. Uh, looking at community input on sites, uh, you know, considering really which, which sites are most feasible and how we can consider them into the process. Um, looking at stakeholder interviews and community surveys to identify constraints and housing needs within the community. And making sure as well that uh, the outreach is done multilingually, uh, that there are clear, accessible, and culturally competent messaging as well. Um, and doing everything once again that we can to meet the HCD standard for a housing element. So I just want to go a little bit more into the Napa Sonoma Subregional Housing Collaborative that I mentioned at the beginning, 
which is uh, being led by Four Leaf uh, in the 16 jurisdictions across the two counties. Uh, we're a sub-regional, it's a sub-regional technical assistance program that is funded by the Association of Bay Area Governments, the nine county regional government. Uh, so the cities don't have to pay for it at all. Um, and it's funded by a regional early action planning grant, which is just north of $200 million from the state to encourage regional collaboration on housing policy issues. Um, so with this, we'll also be having a regional fair housing analysis conducted by uh, the, the Lawyers Committee for Housing uh, with an affirmatively furthering fair housing section for each city. Uh, we'll also be working with uh, an equity working group across the two counties to make sure that we are really doing that hard, reaching hard to reach communities and doing the most effective outreach that we can uh, for the most equitable documents across the jurisdictions. And we'll also have a developer panel to validate sites. Uh, so when, when I mentioned uh, those sites that are not vacant, but uh, need a, just, a reasonable justification to show that they are likely to be developed, um, this de that's where that developer panel comes in. So if there's a site that you know might have a parking lot on it, might have something on it, uh, and uh, we're, or we, need, we have a need to gauge developer interest to make sure that it's actually a viable parcel for the housing element, the developer panel will be able to do that. Uh, so there's no guesswork as to whether or not HCD will accept any of those sites. So with that, I'll turn it over for questions, discussion, and any further public input. Thank you so much. Luke, thank you very much. Um, I will look to see if there's any hands or any questions. I do not see any at the moment. Oh, I do. Uh, uh, Commissioner Murphy? Thanks, Luke, for that presentation. That was really thorough. Um, one of the things that stood out to me was um, just the abundance of opportunity for the community to provide feedback. I was wondering if you could help me understand more about what sort of feedback um, the community can provide that has an impact. I know we're talking a lot about various laws um, that sort of dictate and help guide us on how we need to develop our housing element. And so um, as a community member, I, I'd like to know what sort of feedback I can provide that would be impactful to how we move forward. We will, I'll turn it over to Jane to answer uh, the bulk of our questions. Really quick, uh, Chair Murphy, I just chime in on that. I, from my standpoint, and I asked uh, Luke and Jane to include the housing site selection uh, graphic because that's gonna be critical in showing where we're prioritizing what types of housing development. And so, you know, rather than have folks get frustrated when a specific project comes forward uh, to build next door to them, I really want to engage with people early and often to say, hey, we need to provide this variety of housing types. And these are the locations that we think are suitable. Please let us know your opinion on that. That's one thing I'm specifically looking for. Uh, and then Jane, I'm, I'm interested in hearing uh, what else you want to add to that. <laughs> sure. Um, hi, everyone. Jane Riley, Four Leaf. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, one of the first things that we want from the community is we want to know what the housing issues are. We want to hear people's stories about when they've had a hard time achieving housing or um, if they've had a hard time um, being able to afford the place that they're at and so on. So we want to hear all those things, all the issues that are related to housing. And then we also want to hear from community members what they see as the unique opportunities that, that are available in Katati. And maybe it's something around students and maybe it's something around backyard dwellings and they, it, it could be anything. That's the kind of thing that we want to hear about. And from that initial survey, which we actually have coming out very soon, Noah's already done a couple of surveys, so we've already got some information coming in. But we're, we're a little flexible in our approach of what we want to hear from people because it depends on what people are telling us and where we need to dive in more. So I'm not going to outline exactly what we want to hear from people yet, but we do want their personal stories and we want to hear their issues and we want to hear what opportunities they think there are. People, your community, you're going to find are so incredibly creative. They're going to come up with ideas that you would have never dreamed of. And it, people are remarkable doing that. They, they think about this. Housing is a big deal to most of your community. So I'm really excited to get that going. And as Noah indicated, um, 
this the sites thing is going to be is going to be big. I don't think it's going to be a huge difficulty here, but I think it's going to have to have community buy-in in order to get through the process at the end and achieve state certification. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Chair Murphy, did you have anything further? No, thank you. I appreciate that information. Thank you, Commissioner Moore. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I had a, a question on um, properties that had been um, basically had a, a, a were zoned for commercial, maybe mixed use, and they've been sold over and over again. They've never been developed. Um, in particular, I'm looking at, at the property that was just um, done downtown. And so you were saying that there was eight years of, and then and then they need to be built on. So I'm just kind of curious on, um, we have properties that have had multiple, multiple um, development uh, approved on there, but they've never been built. So I just kind of want to read on that because um, there's many properties in Katahdin like that. Right, I absolutely agree. Um, so what, what Luke was talking about is the new requirement about sites that have been in a previous inventory. So a vacant site that was in your two housing elements ago and was in the last one, you can't use it again because it's assumed to be not really a good site unless you have some kind of a justification. And one of those justifications can be that people are interested in, enough in developing the site that they bring in applications. So the fact that you've had repeated approvals on a site and it's probably the market that's the problem, that could qualify the site to be in the next round. On the other hand, we have to look at why those approvals haven't been getting, haven't been getting through. And we do that with an analysis of constraints. So we'll be looking at what it, what it is that we'll be talking developers and we'll be asking what it is that's keeping them from doing the housing and it might be financing and it might be you know purely personal reasons it might be things that are out of the city's control it might be it, uh, hookup fees i don't know but we're going to find out thank you appreciate it thank you uh council member harvey uh thank you um I, i'd like to follow on on that we um have a handful of people that own property that, um, as was pointed out by Commissioner Moore, it's been entitled and it never gets built for decades. And we get all kinds of excuses as to why it's never built, but we just happen to have a tendency of some developers to just sit on it until they can make what they want to make. So what do we do about that? Because some of it is really, uh, you know, prime property, you know, for instance, there's properties uh, by our train station, but they just sit on it and sit on it and sit on it. What are our options? Boy, those are good questions. And just to help to help make that point a, a few years ago, there was an analysis done by the county and its cities of all the of all the approved but not built projects that we had stacked up over the last year, and it was like a hundred thousand units for the county and all of its cities. It's just insanity. But we use that to prove to the state that it's not us, right? We're we're writing the laws right. We're approving the housing units. They're just not getting built. So it's the market. It's not us. So absolutely, that's happening. When it's a subdivision, there's not much you can do because the state continues to extend those tentative maps on subdivisions. When it is a different kind of a, of a approval, like a use permit design review, there's there are end dates, and um, at some point it's going to run out of entitlement unless it's unless it's a, a subdivision, or the entitlements are tied to the subdivision. Noah will jump in. I just wanted to add, Councilmember Harvey, that one of the things I really prioritized with this housing element, and I've talked to um, the Four Leaf staff about it, is doing some financial analysis to really look to what the true costs of construction are in Sonoma County. So that way we have the ability to 
uh, have some informed feedback uh, and information when, you know, developers um, say, you know, project won't pencil except in X, Y, Z circumstances or they're asking for certain concessions. We want to be informed on what benefits can be provided by what concessions uh, or what the true impacts of the labor issues are or the um, supply chain issues, cost of construction materials, those types of things. So we have asked uh, for leaf to include that in their scope. Uh, that's been included and will be provided uh, whether it's through four leaf and our direct contract or through the housing collaborative work. And I just, I do want to give credit to uh, ABAG MTC and also um, thank again uh, for leaf for jumping on, because I do think it's a really good opportunity for us to have the same consultants doing our housing element under our contract that are working regionally with all the other jurisdictions in the city through some funding provided by ABAG MTC. Uh, and I volunteered to sit on the subcommittee for that group uh, in order to kind of keep tabs and hopefully be able to leverage some economies of scale and, and really get the biggest bang for our buck here at Katati. So Noah, along those lines, um, we talk about, you know, the different levels of affordability and it seems like most of the time at most, all we can get developers to do is the moderate and we're left with the low and very low. What tools in a toolbox where those numbers are forced upon us that we can make developers um, do those because they just choose then to not develop. If, yeah, so if we... <laughs> absolutely. And this is, I think the, this is that you hit the nail on the head with one of the most critical things uh, that, that I hope to come out of that analysis is, okay, what is the true cost of a very low income unit in these various types of projects? Uh, how does that affect the pro forma as compared to a pure market rate project? And then what tools do we have as a city that we might be able to help? And we've talked about some of these things over the last year, uh, maybe deferring the collection of impact fees to occupancy rather than issuance of a building permit. So that way more of the construction loan can go towards building the actual project and then they can pay the, the uh, impact fees when they convert it to more long-term financing. Uh, potentially one of the ideas I've talked about with the city manager, and you know, I don't want to um, get too far ahead of anybody, but maybe potentially using some of our affordable housing money to even subsidize, you know, from the affordable housing fund, even subsidize maybe some of the impact fees on the very low income units. But we have to get creative uh, in thinking about how we might be able to fund some of those um, units and, and make them be able to at least minimize how much they drag down the pro formas of these projects. And then that way we can get all of the benefits of having the housing built, not just the market rate and the moderates, but the low and very low. And we will be looking for those opportunities. Okay, and my last question has to do with, um, you know, it's great that we're gonna get community input. Uh, and I like your idea, Noah, about getting it up front, but the projects that we have seen, we do get audiences and they're very opinionated as, I don't know if you've been on on many of them, but how do we set those expectations with the community? Because we get a lot of, uh, you know, we want Katadi to remain small. How, how do we set that expectation? I would hate to have people come out and we're going to say, well, we want your input. We're going to do this and then say, well, forget it because we're restricted by these laws and you only wanted 10 units. Guess what? You're getting up 50 next to you. How do we set that expectation? That's that's a really good question. <laughs> and it's something that, that we do need to talk about early. Um, it's a lot of it's messaging and it's messaging early. What does it mean if a, the site next to you is on the housing inventory list? What does it mean? It doesn't mean that it's required to develop that way. It will always be up to the property owner what they want to do with that property within the constraints of zoning. It, just because we assigned it, let's say 49 low income units doesn't mean, it's, doesn't mean that it's slated to be developed that way. RENA is a zoning exercise and local jurisdictions aren't required to build the housing. You know, the thought is, as Luke mentioned, they want to put everything in place so that a developer can come in and it would be feasible for them to build the housing. So it's a lot of, um, a lot of talking up front. And I mean, this needs to be done across the board every we have to have similar talking points we all have to be saying the same thing about what it means to be on the list that it doesn't necessarily 
um, mean it's going to be developed with affordable housing. We are not required to build that much housing. We're required to demonstrate to the state that we have enough land zoned for that housing if a developer were to come in and build it. So I think just backing away from that fear that the city's telling me what's going to go on my property or what's going to go next to my property, I think backing away from that fear with um, a little truth telling before the bad information comes out is, is really important. And it, organized groups will try to spread bad information. So it's important to get the messaging out there early and often. And I would Thank just you. add, I would just add, letting people know, you know, what the problems are that we've, that we come to or realize through our analysis and then show what we're trying to solve for, you know, and a lot of, while I absolutely understand some people have certain expectations I think just letting people know what could happen and what the process will be uh, when there's not an actual project proposed next door is the best thing we can do. We need to bring everyone into the tent to help come up with ideas and solve the problem for the whole community. Right, but it's going to be important to set that expectation, you know, uh, up front with folks because if they think they gave you input and they think that their input uh, said one thing and we do something else, that's where... <laughs> That's yeah. where it gets dicey. I completely but. understand, Ms. Har uh, Council Member Harvey. Yeah. I, I've, yeah. Well, one of the things I used to do at neighborhood meetings, and by the way, one of the things we're going to instill is a neighborhood meeting uh, requirement, which we've already been doing, but it's not codified yet. Before any pro big project could come in, we'd have to have a meeting with all the direct neighbors and the developer to talk about it before they even file. But That's great. <laughs> but one of the things I used to always say is, you know, okay, here's the project. And folks would say, well, I don't want... I don't want anything built next door. And I <laughs> yep. totally hear that. Uh, and I'm, I'm taking notes on that. But the general plan says this and the zoning code says that. So if something is going to be built, what are your concerns about it? Because there's some type of base property rights that go with these zoning districts. And, and we it is important to me to communicate that clearly and unequivocally. And that you you hit it right on, and that's what we need to tell people that they can't tell someone next to them that they are not able to um, do something with the property they own. Uh, if I can jump back in really quick on um, public input and how we incorporate it into the housing element, you know, they give us input and then we don't use it. We are required to track all of the public input and then say how we incorporated that into the housing element or if we didn't, why we didn't. So, so what, when people give us input, they will be able to go back and see um, why, it was why it wasn't incorporated or if it was where it was. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And good um, luck. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to remind you, uh, the, the remaining attendees and participants, we have a six o'clock council meeting. So I've got uh, three hands up and I've got Commissioner Hancock. Go ahead. Yes. Hello. Um, I agree with the um, sort of comments about the, the public side um, a question there, how to get that input. But the specific one on um, how to make it um, for any disability or aging um, type housing, um, what we've seen at the moment is, is that it's getting pushed out onto a remote part of the city um, for, for people who are aging, and then they're surrounded by traffic. They can't actually walk anywhere. So do we have a way of actually saying that um, if, if you have, uh, if we're looking at any housing for people who are disabled of some sort, um, uh, that it's going to have the services easily available around it. How do we phrase that? Well, we'll certainly work on that with our with our policies and programs, and hopefully we'll get some input that's really focused on that. Um, if it's one of your priorities to have to have that housing in a in a centralized part of town, or at least have that selection available for aging people or people with disabilities, then that's something that we can write in. Um, it's probably a good idea to have that housing dispersed throughout the community so that people have choices and also because it's a part of affirmatively furthering fair housing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Ford. Thanks. Thanks for the helpful presentation and question. Just a quick question. Also, I'm worried about the, the no reusing 
sites um, issue and justifying. So um, we are not one of those cities that puts unbuildable sites on the list in hopes to prevent development. We put real sites where we really want to see diverse housing. And um, so, so we think most of the sites I, I imagine that are on the current map are in fact viable sites. Does that developer panel that looks at non-vacant land, might they also have a role to play in justifying reuse of sites? Yeah, absolutely. We can include those sites as well. Okay, thanks. And one other comment. On, in the presentation, the numbers on the population age trends graph don't match the bars at all. And so I don't know which to believe, the numbers or the, or the bars. So if at some point you could get us a corrected version of that one slide, I'd appreciate it because I'm curious about that change. Which slide was that? The population age trends. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Lemus. Yes, thank you for the presentation. I had a question about the equity working group that's going to be formed. I had questions about how you identified members. Uh, is it geographically represented? And what activities or how will they engage the community? What are the plans for them? I hope we can call you on that. <laughs> so this has just started out and we have, we've posted to our steering committee of the, um, of the collaborative and Noah is one of our steering committee members. So we've posed the idea of doing that. We've gotten buy-in that we will form an equity working group and kind of what the role is, but it's pretty loose. And we still have to come up with the criteria and the, um, how much the stipend is and what the, what the length of service would be and how many hours we're talking about and what the role is. But the thought is that we're gonna use our equity working group, which might be, um, we're probably gonna be piggybacking on someone else's, right? Because there's only so many people that can serve in equity working groups. The, the thought is that we will use them as ambassadors to do outreach and equip them with kits so that we can get the personal stories and the, um, the real needs and get the outreach and, and input from our hardest to reach communities to inform all of our housing elements. But if, if we could reach out to you for some help in uh, how that should be put together, I would really appreciate that. Uh, sure. Yeah, I might have some ideas on some local groups, um, but I think it needs to be geographically kind of represented, especially. I'm not sure you had mentioned that this is part of the Napa Sonoma or is mm -hmm. it going to be Katati? Is it be separate Napa. or Napa it's Sonoma? Napa, it's part of the Napa Sonoma Collaborative. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. That, mm -hmm. We Thank do you. need Katati specific representation and participation. So we're trying to cast the broad net, but we know that a lot of you folks have your fingers uh, on the pulse of the community and these groups that we need to chat with. And so we definitely want to leverage your resources uh, to help us make sure we meet those needs. Well said. Thank you. Council Member Sparks. Thank you. Um, I appreciated the comments earlier about um, needing to make sure we set expectations for community members who are providing input. and. Um, one thing that's on my mind is how do we make sure that we're getting balanced input from people who maybe aren't necessarily always plugged into what's going on with the city? Because I think there's a huge need for housing and a huge number of people in Katati who do want more housing to be built and don't want to just avoid construction of housing who, who, who recognize because of their lived experience that housing is a, a, a crisis right now. So how do we, how, how, what, do, what is the plan to reach out to um, underrepresented communities and, and low income people um, to make sure that input's coming in as well? Well, that's, that's a great question. And I have a term for, for that. I, I, I try to avoid the STPs, those are the same 10 people who are the ones who know how to show up in city council meetings and know how to talk and know how to get what they want. And they don't necessarily represent the larger population, right? So it's really important when we do our outreach that we are able to um, invite participation with something as simple as a cell phone so that everyone can do it. And um, we, don't, we don't just outreach through the normal channel. Sometimes we'll put QR codes on buses so that people can scan them and take a survey on a bus. Sometimes we'll do text back questions. We will almost always do pop-ups 
in um, sometimes in work areas, sometimes laundromats are a great place to go and survey people that wouldn't normally be showing up at, at city council meetings. So we have lots of different approaches and the, the expectation from HCD to make a diligent effort is, is really serious. And they want you to track the composition of your community and then who's showing up and participating demographically. Are you reaching that cross section that's representative of your community? So it's, it's a, the, the diligent effort is taken very seriously. We're not always um, able to get all of the input from the underrepresented parts of the community that we want which is why through the collaborative, we are gonna be providing some, some stipends so that people who would otherwise need to work during the time that we're meeting will be able to participate and at least get paid for their time. Um, so we're doing those kinds of things, but it is a challenge and we need all the help that we can get. Thank you very much for that response. I appreciate it. Thank you. Vice Mayor Lehman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I was looking back at page 40 at the bullet of suggesting, looking for more creative policies to allow a broader range of site options. And I started thinking what those could be, where they generally lead. And I started thinking it would largely probably be a continued general diminution of current zoning, a general push to higher density. And I started to wonder in a community like ours, which is to some degree built out, rather small, always been small. And the difficulty for us, it is a true value here. This is something that I don't care what side of the political aisle you are on in this community. If you live in a small apartment or big house, everybody likes that this is a small town. So how do we deal with this? Uh, how does this work in the long term when you have a community like this, but numbers continue to go up year after year? I, I see the process eventually forcing this community to change into something that I honestly believe from my years of living here and years of representing it, that the great bull would be very concerned about. Um, one does forced growth become untenable. Um, I'll just say, I think two things. I think my colleague, Councilmember Harvey nailed it when she talked about the stories, uh, because I think the stories you'd hear if you really talk to the unplugged people in Katati, the average working people that fill most of our neighborhoods, would be they would be very unhappy with this. They don't even realize the ramifications of one site due to SB9 becoming potentially up to six separate residences between uh, extra units and splitting of the ho individual houses. And lastly, we talk about solving the problem for the community through discussion, but due to the rules, and I see this only goes one way, it only solves one way, so we're not really giving anybody much options other than what we're pushing. I, I have some discomfort listening to the process that's being put forward, that it's not going to really hear the voice of most Katadians, but uh, it will miss this larger group. You're willing to reply to that. I know I've used most of the time. We only have a few minutes left, but those are the concerns I have. I think they're concerns of our community. Any suggestions how this process is supposed to work in the long term in a community like Katadi, which certainly isn't San Jose or San Francisco, I'd be interested in hearing because I don't see how it does. I think it's untenable. Well, I think I think you've hit on a lot of points that are, are worthy of a much larger discussion than what we're we're doing here today. Just what 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 the state is assigning us the fact that we're losing population, not gaining population, but we're still getting these big numbers. But what I want you guys to focus on is what your community wants and your community needs, and let us work. Let us do the back end work about fitting that into the legislative requirements. I want you guys to, to listen and guide programs towards those that fulfill the needs of your community. Let's take for an example, density bonuses. We have, we have people with disabilities and aging people. What if we, what if Katati had a density bonus program that went beyond what the state requires you to do and says, okay, instead of the state density bonus program, you can get this bigger density bonus. If you give us units that are work for seniors, disabled people, and these two other needs that you've identified. So you really focus the programs towards what your specified and identified community needs are. And I hope, I hope to change your mind and I hope to make you more hopeful as this process goes on. 
And I do think, and, and I'll end it at this because we've got two minutes, but Jane, I, and I do think that is creative in good thinking policy on one level, but on the other level, it also underscores my concerns of where this community is going to be concerned about. It's generally increasing even further beyond the huge mandates of increase that the state's already put on this small community. So that's the basic prop. That's the elephant in the room and the state, the discussion of this and the way this process is set up. There's no ability for them to assess individual places. It is one size fits all to a degree. Vice Mayor Lemon, I, I would just chime in. So my goal is, is, and my hope is that we can take some of the work that we've done with the downtown specific plan and the Santero Way area and, and leverage the sites we've already identified as a community as appropriate for some of our development and yeah. utilize those and may really focus on getting those incorporated through the reuse process if we need to as our sites. Uh, I, I think we're going to be able to be successful with putting the growth where the community's already said we want to do it. And again, as Jane mentioned, uh, we'll rely on their expertise and their knowledge to get the our goals to line up with the HCD mandated requirements and still meet the expectations of the community. I, I'm very, very confident we're going to be able to do And that. I have every confidence in you, Noah, and, and I do believe in the short term we can have success with some of this, although to say that the community supports the areas we've already, we've done it as a council. We talked about a decade ago. I don't think most people know it, but I still think that can work. What I'm talking about, and I'll leave everybody with this thought, as the process exists now and the way it escalates every year, what happens when we get past that? I don't see that working. So that's the thought I wanted to leave us with. Uh, appropriately negative as we go to one more meeting, so apologies for that. But thank you for the discussion and the input from both of you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Sparks, did you have one more thought or something come up? No, I'm, we're out of time, so let's move on. Okay. Uh, I want to thank all the commissioners. Uh, Chair Murphy, uh, Commissioner Hancock, Commissioner Lemus, Commissioner Moore, thank you all for participating. Thank you, Noah. Uh, Ms. Riley and Mr. Lindenbush, thank you very much for that presentation. There's a lot thank of information you. and a lot to absorb. So I'm sure we'll be working on this for years to come. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. So with that, I will adjourn this joint meeting.